Welcome everyone to the November 12th Professional VMware V-Brown Bag. Tonight we have Jeff Hicks who's going to give us an intro to PowerShell. I'm your host Ahmad Yunus and we just have a couple of show notes to take care of before we get started. You can follow the V-Brown Bag at the various Twitter accounts or join in on the conversation using the hashtag. Uh, don't forget you can also ask questions in the GoToMeeting window. Just a reminder of the various podcasts that we have going on globally. Yes, the V Brown Bag is uh, taking on the podcasts and uh, one show at a time. Um, we have Jeff Hicks tonight. Uh, I'm Ahmad Yunus, and we also have Anthony Hook, who's uh, co-hosting as well. So Hello. with that, I'm going to pass the ball on to Jeff. Okay. Well, thank you, and thank you for having me, and welcome, everyone, for taking some time out of your night. Oh, it looks like I'm a presenter now. <clears throat> I can show my screen, and hopefully, i got to hide the control panel. All right, so I'm assuming that you are all seeing my slide deck, which I'm calling PowerShell Principles and Practice. Uh, if people can't see it, then I'm assuming Anthony or someone will pop in and tell me otherwise. No, we can, yeah, we can see it. Is, You're yeah. good? Okay. <clears throat> well, what I wanted to talk about tonight was to kind of give everyone who's watching this series, because we're kind of at the beginning of this series, kind of a, a groundwork, a, a common ground for PowerShell. Some of you may have worked with PowerShell before. Some of you, it may be Power What. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted to go through a few things just to reinforce maybe what you already know or at least help you get the ground running. Obviously, I'm not going to teach you PowerShell in an hour. But these are kind of some core concepts that I want to make sure you understand as you go forward, forward in using uh, PowerShell. I've been using PowerShell since the days of beta when it was still Monad. I'm actually PowerShell MVP. So for those of you who don't know who I am, um, I write and speak and train and do lots of stuff uh, on PowerShell. PowerShell is my day job. So I'm very happy to share this stuff with you. Okay, so real quickly, a kind of a kind of a brief agenda. I want to go through some slides and I want to get into actual demos so you can see these concepts and principles in action. So first off, I always like to talk about what I call the PowerShell paradigm. Because you need to understand why we have PowerShell and why it matters to you, whether you are an IT pro or a developer or in this new DevOps world. The whole thing of PowerShell comes about because if we want to scale, if we have a huge enterprise and we want to be efficient, you know, we can't do that with a GUI. Yeah, you can, but the GUI kind of has to be designed to that. And that's the whole point. GUIs are designed to do what they're designed to do. So we can't get enterprise efficiency and automation with a GUI. In the past, we've had things like VBScript, for example, or batch files, or Perl, and other languages, and command line tools. Way back in the days of NT4, we had a slew of resource kit tools that we could use to manage our environment. But those all tended to be text-based, and they were all different syntax. It was complicated to figure, OK, I've got this new product, new tool set. How do I use it? How do I do it? What do I do? All text-based. PowerShell kind of solves these problems for us by introducing an object-centered management engine that's built on the .NET framework. Everything in Microsoft like for the last God, 20 years, it seems, uh, is on .NET. So it makes sense that PowerShell is now the management engine that's built on .NET. The key point here, and we'll go through this, you'll see examples of this many times uh, tonight, instead of working with text or results of a command or parsing text or gripping or setting or awking or any of those things that happen in other languages and shells, PowerShell works with objects in a pipeline. And once you get your head around that paradigm shift of I'm not dealing with 
text that I see on the screen, but I'm dealing with an object, and I'm going to manipulate that object in the pipeline with these things called commandlets, and then get a result. Once you get your head around that, then you wonder, God, why did I take so long to learn PowerShell, and where has this been my entire career? So this management engine that I'm talking about, PowerShell, as it comes from Microsoft, is basically it's a DLL, and it is hosted in an application. The applications that ship out of the box with Windows are the CMD XE console shell. That's the blue screen that when someone says PowerShell, that's what most people think of. And yes, it's kind of a crappy experience because it's the same CMD window we've had since Windows 2000, actually even probably even since Windows NT. So you don't have control C, control V, you know, it doesn't have a cool transparency. It's very limited, but it's everywhere, right? It, CMD.exe is on every box of Windows that's out there, and so PowerShell runs inside that application. It can also run as a GUI. Uh, Microsoft ships a integrated script editor, the PowerShell ISC, which is another application that hosts PowerShell. Now, the ISC has some additional features, such as uh, debugging and a script and a rudimentary script editor. It's, it's, it is extensible. But again, the PowerShell engine is running inside that ISC. And there are a number of third-party apps that can also host PowerShell. Uh, Sapiens, PowerShell Studio, for example. Uh, Idera has PowerShell Plus, uh, Power GUI. Uh, even other products from Microsoft can host the PowerShell engine. If you're a .NET developer, you can write your own hosting application and run all these PowerShell commands inside your own app. Need a GUI? Well, we just build it on top of PowerShell. When PowerShell first came out, people thought, oh, God, it's, it's going to be like Unix. I've got to type everything. Well, yes and no. Um, commands can, are more powerful if you can type them, because as you're going to see, it, we can do a lot of great things with that. But if you need a GUI, then we just build it on top of the PowerShell engine. And you can use either Windows Forms or WPF in order to present either the results of your PowerShell commands, to provide an interface to your PowerShell script or commands. But if you need a GUI, you build it. Um, Microsoft does this. Other vendors do this. Way back when PowerShell was really getting started, I think it was Exchange 2007, I believe, has a graphical server manager tool. It meets probably 90% of typical Exchange tasks. I need to create a mailbox, uh, create a storage group, very simple, basic tasks. But for the senior Exchange admin, that GUI is really limited. If I need to find all of the mailboxes created after a certain date of a certain size for a particular storage group and move it to another storage group on another server, the GUI really can't do that because it's not designed to do that. But you could do that from the PowerShell console using a set of PowerShell commands, and that would probably be a one or two line command with really no scripting involved. So PowerShell is this engine that we're going to use to drive how we manage our Windows environment. So PowerShell often is compared, first of all, as a interactive command line shell. You type a bunch of commands, and wonderful things happen. But it is also an easy-to-learn <coughs> interpretive scripting language. Any command that you take and that you can run and type at the PowerShell prompt, you can turn into a script. Uh, Jeffrey Snover, who is the father of PowerShell, now a distinguished engineer at Microsoft and in charge of all Windows Server goodness things, used uh, to tell the story about describing PowerShell as Shimmer. If you remember, there was a Saturday Night Live uh, parody back in the 90s or late 80s, I think, for Shimmer, a delicious 
dessert topping, and a fabulous floor wax. Well, PowerShell is like that. It is a terrific interactive command line shell and a really easy to learn and use scripting language. And on top of all that, it's also extensible. So other people like VMware, for example, can write a set of PowerShell tools that you can plug into this PowerShell engine and you can write your own. So when people say, ah, is it a shell, is it a script, do I, which, what do I do? Well, I want both. So yes, please give me a shell and a script. So it's not really an either or. You probably will end up using PowerShell in both fashions. So here's where we're at though today. You know, everything I've told you up to this slide is really kind of where we were at with, say, PowerShell v1 and v2. Starting with PowerShell v3, where v4 now, v5 is in preview with lots of other great new features. PowerShell, we're starting to see, and the way I look at it, is the glue that kind of holds everything together that we manage. So think of what it is that you have to manage. It could be a SharePoint farm. It could be Active Directory users, Exchange, um, SQL servers, web servers, just file and print servers. We can manage those things with our PowerShell engine. We can either approach it from the shell, type commands, things happen. We can take those commands and put it in a script. We can plug in other tools from other vendors that plug into that. But then we also get new things, what I call kind of extensions of the language, things like PowerShell workflow, desired state configuration, something I'll talk about at the very end of my slides here tonight. And then whatever else you know, Microsoft sends down the pipe. These things are going to take advantage of the PowerShell experience and knowledge and language skills that you develop. So, for example, workflow. Workflow has been around for a while, but in order to build a workflow, you typically had to be a .NET developer because you use Visual Studio and you build this fancy XAML <clears throat> construct and deploy and all of that. Well, in PowerShell version 3, they introduced a way of building for IT pros who may not be developers, may not have Visual Studio, but want to, to take advantage of workflow to build a workflow in a PowerShell script file. So that it kind of looked like PowerShell, even though the underlying technology was actually once PowerShell handed off to the workflow engine became workflow, but it was the glue that made that possible, that transition from IT Pro to something maybe into the developer world. And we'll see, we're going to see this also with desired state configuration as we move further and further into PowerShell, especially once version 5 ships. So ultimately comes down to, you know, why is PowerShell important? Well, it is the Microsoft management standard. Everything that Microsoft ships has to be managed through PowerShell. You'll also see, and you probably already have that a lot of other vendors such as VMware, Veeam, Citrix also support PowerShell <clears throat> and they will offer, often free, a set of PowerShell tools to manage their particular products. Now the nice thing is it's the same PowerShell. Yes, the commands obviously are different, but once you understand the basics of objects in the pipeline, sorting, grouping, filtering, exporting, converting. It doesn't matter whether you are getting an Active Directory user, an Exchange mailbox, a uh, VMware virtual machine. It, it's all the same. Your learning curve becomes that much shorter because you already know the basics. All you have to learn is what's new in, say, the VMware command list, the Power CLI stuff. Yes, not all vendors embrace PowerShell the same way. You'll find some implementations may be better than others. Actually, you'll probably find that true even across different Microsoft products. But fundamentally, it should all still work the same. And the PowerShell community is really active and very 
open to helping people. So if you get a product, say, hey, I can't quite figure out how to use this, I'm sure you can find someone who will be able to, to help you out. The other reason for why PowerShell matters, and this is especially true if you start getting uh, scripts and start developing kind of recorded PowerShell implementations, you get documented and consistent IT processes. So let's say every week I have to come in, and on Monday morning I need to get a list of the uh, most recent errors and warnings on my mission critical servers and review them, right? Very typical IT pro task. So I can write a, <clears throat> I could just write, run the PowerShell commands to do that and review it. But I don't want to type that all the time, so I can write a script to do it, come in, run my script command, I decide, you know what, I need to go on vacation. And so Joe has to cover for me, and so I tell Joe, hey, on Monday morning, open up your PowerShell prompt, because he's got the same privileges I do, type this script, and you'll get the event reports, and you'll know what to do from there. Everything is consistent. He doesn't have to try to fudge and figure out, okay, what do I type? He just types the script, and it just happens, no matter who runs it. And it doesn't matter, like the, the get event log example, it doesn't matter whether I'm querying one, ten, or a thousand machines, it's really the same set of commands. PowerShell scales extremely well for that sort of thing. So we get documented and consistent processes. With PowerShell, you are, will be able to manage everything. That's Microsoft's goal, is that you'll be able to manage everything from your Windows 15 desktop, let's say, with PowerShell, even things that are not running a Windows operating system. Already in PowerShell version 5, there are commandlets that you can use to control and manage switches, certain network devices. You can configure some Linux boxes with desired state configuration. So at some point, it doesn't matter what the box is that you have to manage, what the thing is. You'll do it with PowerShell. And that's the goal, and that's why PowerShell is so important for you to learn. It's definitely no longer a case of if you'll use PowerShell, just a matter of when. And for those of you who are still waiting, say, okay, um, why should I be doing it? I'm hoping by the end of tonight you realize, yeah, I'd better get in on this, or I'm going to be left behind and be flipping burgers or taking orders for a French fries, and you don't want that. PowerShell, yes, when you see some of my examples, if you're new to PowerShell, it will overwhelm you possibly, but this is like a language. It's like learning Hungarian. It's a complicated language. It's got its own syntax and funny little punctuations and, and whatnot. But once you learn it, learn the basics, then you can apply it everywhere. And for me, the biggest takeaway is that I get great efficiency at scale. So again, it doesn't matter whether I'm doing something for one user, 10 users, or 1,000 users, really the same PowerShell commands will handle across the entire range of objects, whatever it is that I need to, to manage. All right, so then let's look at some principles of PowerShell. These are kind of getting more into the language and elements. Big thing here, and this is probably the number one uh, bullet point that I try to get across when I'm speaking at conferences or doing training classes, and that is PowerShell is all about objects in a pipeline. Now, those objects typically are .NET objects. Uh, but they could be COM objects, and you can even create your own types of objects. There are ways that we can do that in PowerShell actually pretty easily. So we've got objects. These objects are controlled and managed and manipulated with these things called commandlets. That's the CMD LETS word. Commandlet, think little command. These are single purpose tools designed to work with objects. The commandlets kind of follow the same approach like I have in Linux, where you've got a small single-purpose utility. 
We don't have commandlets in PowerShell that are monolithic that do five different things. They do one thing, like get a service or stop a service. Commandlets are easy to learn, really, because they follow, and PowerShell in general, it's easy to learn because there are some consistent standards that have been implemented. Yes, you will find some exceptions to the rule, and we try to stomp on vendors who decide that they know better because they don't. Um, all the commandlets you should see will follow a standard verb-noun naming convention. The verb comes from a standard list of .NET verbs, and they're plain English verbs of things that you would do, like get, set, remove, add, stop, start. And then the noun is the singular version of the object, uh, file, mailbox, website, uh, VM, VM switch, all those different things that you might need to manage. So if you see a commandlet like stop service, there's nothing cryptic about it. I bet I know what that commandlet's going to do. Commandlets can be customized with a set of parameters. Again, unlike the days of NT and resource kit tools, where the syntax would vary between two commandlets. Is it slash computer name, or dash computer name, or is it dash system? And then is there a colon in the name, or a space in the name, or an equal sign? So you're constantly looking at help for every command. In PowerShell, it's always dash, the name of the parameter, a space, and then the value. And as you'll see, uh, even some parameters are positional. So if I do get service bits, I don't have to do get service dash name bits. Dash name would be the parameter. Because if I do get service bits, PowerShell is pretty sure, you know, I bet bits is the name of the service you want me to get, so I'll do that without having to put in dash name. And the names are typically consistent, so most every commandlet you'll see dash computer name. And even more importantly, and I'm going to show you some of this here, all these commandlets are really well documented, especially the ones out of the box from Microsoft. A complete help system built in with lots of great examples, and it's updated. You can also get the help online. So it's not like you have to read some 500-page book, although as an author of books, I love it when people read books. Uh, but there's a lot of great information right at your fingertips. So we've got object in a pipeline being manipulated and working with commandlets. The last big principle about all of this, and I've said this before and I'll probably say it again, there's no difference between an interactive set of commands and a script. Other than in the script, you just type it once. So if I run a command at the prompt, you know, I want to get all the services on this computer where the status is not running. I could type that command interactively, but if that is something I want to do repeatedly, I'll probably build a little script or function to do that. So I don't only so I'd only have to type it once in the script file. Conversely, if I have a script, I could copy the contents of that script, paste it into a PowerShell session, and PowerShell would run through every command as I pasted it, just as if I had typed it. So with scripting, you can then create your own tools with advanced functions. You can package them into modules so you can deploy them and share them with other people. But that's the nice thing about PowerShell. Scripting or interactive use, they're really the same thing. It's just a matter of where you're typing your commands and are they persistent or not. So that said, let's get into a little terminology. Because these are things you'll hear people talk about. I want to make sure that we all know what things are. So, variable. A variable in PowerShell is just a container. It's the hold my beer concept. Variables in PowerShell always start with a dollar sign when we reference them and can be whatever you want. So I can have a variable called dollar beer, which would hold the contents of whatever my beer object might be. An alias 
is a shortcut. So instead of saying beer, I can say B. So I'll say I some command uh, get beer. I could create an alias GB. So instead of me having to type get beer, I could just type GB. These transitions are often used for, I'm sorry, these aliases are often used as transitions for people coming from other languages such as Linux or uh, even the, the CMD shell. So instead of having to figure out, okay, what command do I run to get a directory listing of the folder that I'm in, if you come from the CMD world, you know, well, I can type the dir command, and the dir command will work in PowerShell, but actually that is an alias for the actual PowerShell command, get child item. So you don't have to go and try to learn all these new commands. You can use this kind of the same commands, at least to get you started so you learn the new syntax. And they also can save you time for typing. Yes, get beer doesn't take that long to type, but GB is faster. Um, it's of me typing get process, I always screw something up. I'm always using PS, which is an alias for get process. So we've got aliases, B is for beer. Uh, then we have these things called snap-ins and modules. This is the how do I get my beer. A snap-in and a module are two different technologies that third-party developers and vendors use, or even Microsoft uses, I should say, as well, to extend the core functionality of this PowerShell engine. Pretty much everything we do now is a module, but snap-ins are still used in, in some cases. The differences between the two are really pretty simple. A snap-in and often you may also see this referred to as a PS snap-in. A snap-in has to be installed on the computer where you want to use it. That snap-in will typically contain a bunch of commands, commandlets, and hopefully will also include some documentation, some help files for those commandlets. You can then add that snap-in and have, then have access to all of those commands. But it has to be installed on the system where you want to use it. Often there's additional components that have to be registered on the computer. That's why things get packaged as a snap-in. Modules, on the other hand, typically are all file-based, which means they don't have to be installed per se. PowerShell by default will look for them in some predefined locations, and if it sees a module in that location, in PowerShell, starting in PowerShell version 3, all you had to do was just type the name of the command and they would load the module and you would have access to all of those commands. So it's a little bit easier to deploy modules because you don't have to install anything. You can just stick the module in the right location and PowerShell will automatically find it. And then we have functions. This is when you get the point, you know, hey, I want to brew my own beer. Yeah, these, these, this brew I have here is pretty good, but I think I got an idea for something better and it'll help me do my job a little bit easier. So you can create your own PowerShell commands, typically as functions. And then these functions can be packaged as modules. And then you can share your beer with other people. All right, so that's kind of basic terminology. Uh, some key commandlets. These are things that I need, if you're learning PowerShell, you need to read help and understand how to use these. these you'll find yourself using these commandlets probably more than anything else, especially as you're just getting started. Help. Obviously, the most important thing to know in PowerShell is how to use the help system. The commandlet is called get help, uh, but there's also a help command, which kind of is a wrapper for the get help Commandlet simplifies things a little bit for you. And I'm going to show you some of these things in, actually, I'm going to show you all of these things in action in just a little bit. Get command. Get command will allow you to identify what commands you have, where they came from, how they work. Well, you'll see how that works in just a second. Get member is the commandlet that you can use to identify, I got this object. What does it look like? What can I do with it? You will pipe commands, like get service, for example, 
and you can pipe that to get member and get member will say oh I see an object coming in and I can unroll it and I can see here are the properties here are the methods here are some alias properties here's these other pieces that the PowerShell team added get member will be your friend that's a terrific tool for identifying the nature of these objects that we're working with in the pipeline because what you see when you run a command is not necessarily everything that there is to that object, to that command line. A lot of what happens in PowerShell is designed for IT pros so that you don't have to do a lot of work. There's a lot of kind of default views and default displays and default property sets, but once you discover what else is behind the defaults, then you can really get into some great and interesting stuff. And that's where select object comes into play. With select object, I can select what properties I want to see. Even if I don't see them in the default display, I can say, hey, you know, I want properties X, Y, and Z, because I know that they, they are there because I saw them with get member. You can also create your own properties with select object. I've got, we have lots of fun with select object groups, so I'll show you here in just a second. In fact, I think it's time for a demo. We'll check the time here. We're doing okay. Yeah, you're you're good. Okay. All right. So, um, so this is the PowerShell console. I got the blue screen, and I've in my own directory here called scripts. So everyone can see that here. So the PowerShell console and works pretty easily. You just can navigate just like you would anywhere else. So let's go to the C drive. You know you can type dir. You can oh what do I want to do here? Oh, I can do get service using the console. You can do tab completion. I just hit the tab key. So there is a command list that ran. So you can just type whatever commands you want, as often as you want, to create variables, all that. Now I'm going to spend actually most of my demonstrations though in the PowerShell ISE, which hopefully you can you can all see here now. Primarily because I have all my commands already typed up, so I don't have to try to type and talk at the same time and it's also something that I can share with you so if you want to go through these things you'll have them without having to try to take notes. The PowerShell ISE, now I've configured mine by the way, normally you will see, let's clear this screen here, something like this where you've got the, this is a script pane up top and then the console pane down here at the bottom. You can type commands down here just as you would in the PowerShell console. In the script pane, and I've just maximized it here, Control R will allow you to toggle back and forth between the two. I'm not going to run these as scripts. What's nice in the PowerShell ISE is I can just select a line, either completely like that, or as long as my cursor is anywhere in the line, and then press F8 or this little run selection and it will run just that line of code. So that's what I'm going to be doing in my demos so I don't have to type it. I'll just run the selection. So you just pretend that I typed it. Uh, $PS version table is probably the best way to determine what version of PowerShell you have running. So you can see here that I'm running PowerShell version 4. I've got version 4 of the CLR and I have PowerShell remoting version 2.2 .2, and version 3 of the WSMAN stack. We're not, unfortunately, don't have time to get into all of the remoting pieces. But $PS version table, and that is a variable. It's built into PowerShell. You don't have to do anything with that. So get help. When you run, if you just run get help, you're, you will get an about topic. This is a context uh, help topic, and it will explain all about the help system. Here we run this 
back in the console here. So I do get help. All right, see, it's the exact same thing. There's no difference between really what you do in the console versus the ISC. So let me show you how this works. Let's do help. Let's say, you know, I know there's things that PowerShell can do with servers. I want PowerShell to tell me, show me help for everything that you know about PowerShell, about service. So help service. PowerShell searches and says, oh, wow, I have all these commands. Looks like they all have service in the name. These all come from different modules. Now, on my box, by the way, I'm running Windows 8.1 with RSET installed, plus I have some of my own modules, so your display may be different than what I have here. So it knows about those commands, and you know, let's say in the list I see, oh, there's get service, first one on the list. So let's run help get service. I'm going to clear the screen here. So this is what you get. Kind of like a man page if you're from the Linux world. I get the name, a synopsis. I get the syntax. And some commandlets will have multiple ways of running. Uh, they're called parameter sets. And so get servers can be used three different ways. You'll notice some parameters, like dash name, dash computer name, are in multiple sets, and some are limited to one set. Um, you can only use one parameter set. PowerShell will figure out what, which one to use. You just type the parameters that you want to use. And then you get a description and some related links. The parameter names, as you can see, all start with a dash. Anything that's in a square bracket means it is optional. You don't have to type it. Or, I'm sorry, it's not required. So let's jump here to like this dash dependent services. I don't have to use this parameter. But if I do, I need to type the full, I need to use dash dependent services. Whereas the name parameter, notice how that is in square brackets. That means I don't have to do get service dash name because it is expecting a string. So I can, by default, and you'll learn this through experience, get service by default will return all services. Or if I specify the first position here, the name of a service, it will return that service. Or, for those of you who are new to this sort of thing, those little square brackets, uh, face-to-face, -face, that means it can take a collection or multiple names. And we just typically separate them by commas in PowerShell. But let me, let's go back here to help, because there's more to this, what we see here. You can also run get service, because get help is a dash full parameter. When you do dash full, which is what I typically recommend that you do, let's scroll back up to the top here. Not only do you get the same syntax and description, but you also get information about all of the parameters. Usually there's a description, tells you whether it's required, whether it's positioned or named, uh, any sort of default value, whether it can accept pipeline input. So you go, go through all of those, you have notes, and then the best part, all of the examples of how to use this particular command. That is extremely handy. If you just want to see the examples, then just run get service dash examples. And there are just the examples for get service. Now it can be tricky sometimes to look at help because it's scrolling around and stuff. So we also have now there's this was introduced um, God, I'm losing track of all the different versions. Uh, what happened in PowerShell version 4, uh, I think it was also available in, in V3, this dash show window, which will display the help in this pop-up window. And you can do a search, so if you want to search for a computer, and then just next and find all the matches. 
you can change the size. You know, if you had a multiple multiple monitor setup, you know, you can just drag this off to one side, and this would just stay up. But this gives you full full help. So that is quite handy to have there. There is also, if you noticed here, uh, there is also a dash online parameter. Because PowerShell Help now has to be updated and installed on the computer where you want to use it, you can always get the most up-to-date help by going online. So I wanted to, I could do help get service dash online. I'm not going to right now. And this would open up uh, my browser and take me right to the MSDN page for that particular command. Sometimes the help that is online may be newer. Uh, the online help sometimes might have community content or other questions or other elements. So you might like looking at the help online. Quick tip here for you. In the, if you're using the PowerShell ISE, if you put your cursor on any commandlet, like I just have it there in Get Service, and press the F1 key, you should get pop-up help. That's a very handy little trick there. So in addition to all of the commandlets that have help, there are also a large number of about topics. And I say the about topics because they all start with about. These are help files. Typically, these are on some concept about PowerShell. For example, uh, scripts. So if you wanted to, I could then do, you know, I have this here in my demo, help about underscore scripts and run that. This also supports dash show window. So then you can read about a particular topic. Uh, the only thing you can't do is there's no dash online for the about topics. So you need to get in the habit, <coughs> excuse me, you need to get in the habit of learning how to read and use the PowerShell help. There's a lot of great information there. All right, next key element here is get command. In fact, let's ask PowerShell, hey, how do I use get command? And I'm going to go through some of this quickly because I'm going to trust you'll go back if you're not used to these commands and figure out and read the help and understand them a bit more. So by default, get command will search my computer for every commandlet that it knows about from all of the modules that are installed. Because I've got the, the RSAT, there's a lot. So those are all of the tools that I have, and that's not counting my modules that I can import. These are basically all the things that are in the system that are system modules. So I can I have lots of things that I can do. With get command, you can also limit your search. You can say, find me all of the commands that have the verb get. Or find me all of the commands that have a noun of service. And you can also use wildcard. So if you just want to find, uh, say you just know the portion of the name, but you think there might be more, then go ahead and throw in a, a wildcard. Or you can just do a single command, um, get commands to get service. And so that will show you where that, mod, where that command comes from. There's some other things that we can do with that when we get to select object. Well, actually, you know what? I'll give you a preview here, select star. So there's all the information that I can discover about this particular command. Uh, aliases real quickly. I can type the dir command, which will give me a directory listing. Or I can do ls. Let's say, you know, I don't know what that dir command really is. Well, have PowerShell tell you. Ask for help. So I can do help dir, 
and I can see, oh, this is an actual PowerShell command called get child item. So I can use the dir command, and PowerShell just substitutes get child item. But that also means that I can't use the parameters for the dir command from the CMD shell. I have to use these parameters here, like dash path or dash recurse. So if I want to do recursive lurk, search, I don't do dir slash s. I would do dir dash recurse. Or I can just run get child item. Or actually, there's another A, which is GCI, which I could also run. And they all work the same. Same is true of get command. You can discover what the appropriate command is based on the alias. There is a commandlet called, surprisingly enough, get alias. That will also help you resolve it. Or work with aliases. Or a number of command lists you can use so you can create your own aliases, make life very easy for yourself. All right, so let's quickly aliases. Big thing here, though, are objects. So let's let me clear the screen here. Let's run very typical command get process. And what I get is output of all the processes running on my particular computer. A lot of the commands I have, you could also connect to remote machines. I'm just going to stick to local machines for, for right now. Now, that looks like text, and it is, because at the end of the PowerShell pipeline, PowerShell has to, just has to display the results. I can't read object. Um, I can only read text, so PowerShell displays a text representation, formats the results for me, so I have something nice and neat and easy to read. So I have this default display. But there's more to the picture here. If I pipe get process and send it to get member, I can discover that get process is writing an object of, scroll back up here, this particular type. That's only useful because if I'm really troubleshooting something or researching something, I'm going to uh, Google or Bing, throw this in my search, and more likely I'll end up on the MSDN pages. But these are all of the things, the members of that particular type of object. Now, things that are alias properties, for example, are something that was added by the PowerShell team. So instead of me, IT Pro, having to know a process name as a property, I can just use name. Or to simplify things, instead of having to type virtual memory size, I can just use VM. Um, we're going to skip events. Uh, methods, most of the time we don't deal with having to work with methods because a lot of the common stuff that we need to do with these objects, there's a command that will handle the method for us. So even though, for example, there is a kill method, we're going to use the stop process commandlet. And then here are all of the properties. See, there's a lot more than what showed up in that default. And there are other ones that are added again by the PowerShell team. And you can extend this to yourself. So there are some additional properties that are not part of the actual .NET system that diagnostics that process object. So you can get all that information as well. And once you know that, then we can use things like select object. Select object can be used a couple ways. You can either select certain properties or you can select a certain number of objects as well as some unique objects. So I can say, you know what, I want to run get process and just, just give me the first five. That's all I care about. I just want to get a little sample. Dash first would be the parameter. Or I can say, you know what, I know there are some other properties there. So let's run get process and let's select the ID, the name, working set, VM, path, and start time. So I can use those alias properties. And there they are. Now my display is a little bit different because of the properties that I asked for. PowerShell will figure out the best way to display it. Uh, we don't have time to get into formatting, but you can control whether you want it to be a formatted list or formatted as a table. But I got the information that I wanted, not what PowerShell wanted to give me. Filtering. 
uh, where is an alias for where object? Dollar sign underscore, and this is the pipeline, right? This is what we've done here. Where it said get all the process objects and then hand them off to the another command. Let's select object and let it do its thing. And then at the end here, there's nothing written. At the end here, the, the PowerShell engine will look at what's left and display the results for me. So I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to say get all my processes where the working set size of every object that comes into me, dollar sign underscore is a placeholder for that. So instead of me having to try to hard code or handle that programmatically, that just says, oh, I see service A coming in. Let's That goes into dollar sign underscore. Let's look at the working set property. Hey, if that is greater or equal to 25 megabytes, then keep it. Otherwise, throw it out of the pipeline. So this should show me this line here. These are all of the processes that have a working set size greater or equal to 25 megabytes. We can continue and build on this. So I can say, you know what, let's take that. But all I care about are these particular properties. And there's no programming or scripting involved here. Yeah, this is in a script file. It's only because I didn't want to have to try to type and talk at the same time here or we'd be all night. But I can take this same command, copy, come back here to my PowerShell session here, and it works just as well. We can sort objects, again, using the pipeline. Uh, I want to sort on the working set property. Uh, F1 for help. You can see how to work with sort objects. Sort is the alias. The default sort is in ascending order. You know what? But I wanted to sort in descending order. Sort and you know what? I just care the first five. So these would be my top processes by working set size. And these sort and filtering, you notice that the commandlet names are object. It doesn't matter whether it's a process, a file, a mailbox, a user account. Same with get member. Once you discover what the properties are, you can work with those properties using these kind of these key and core commandlets. See how these just keep building. Get the processes, grade them 25 megs, sort, select the properties. Just keeps going. In fact, let's do all that. You know what? I want to export it to a CSV file. So now I have created a CSV file. The nice thing about CSV files is I could later import it back into PowerShell and reconstitute those objects so I could discover them or look at them. Um, say you're troubleshooting a problem. And I could say, hey, uh, export. Uh, those processes to XML, send me the XML file. I can import the XML file on my machine and I can look at those objects, look at that data, and I can see exactly what it looked like when you exported it. That is really cool and I think very powerful, powerful stuff. All right, so that's kind of some really basic objects in the pipeline. And when you're building you know, say you want to build a long expression like what I have here on line 71. Don't, especially as you're beginning, don't try to write this all at once. I recommend take a programmatic or an iterative approach. Type the first part, get process, does that work? Then add the filtering, does that work? Are you getting what you're expecting? Then do the sorting. Because if you try to type it all out at once, and something is messed up, which probably will be, you won't know necessarily, at, okay, at what point in my expression, what if I messed up? And you may have messed up multiple things. But if you start simple and keep adding, you'll be much happier in the long run. All right? So the, the second part of the demo, and this, I, again, I wanted to reinforce this idea that there's no difference between running something interactively versus working in a script. So what I have here in demo two, this 
is technically a one line command. I just hit enter after the pipe so that it would be easier to read on the screen. We're going to pretend that this is something that I would have typed at the PowerShell console. Okay, this is not a script per se. I just have the command pre-written, if you will. It may be hard to read, maybe kind of hard to understand. But again, if I'm typing this, I want to be efficient. So I'm going to get the event logs. Actually, I'm going to kick this off because it may take a moment to run. And what this is doing is querying the event logs on Chicago DC04, my will test network, the system event log looking for all errors that have happened in the last 36 hours. I am then grouping those objects, those event log entries. I'm going to group them by the source property. And then that's going to give me a different type of object. And then I'm going to sort them in descending order. So I can see in the last 36 hours on Chicago DC04, for example, I had 180 DCOM errors. And I did have some problems with my domain controllers, which I since resolved, but that's good. You can see there's some, some data there. So then I decided, you know, the next thing I want to do, and maybe this, again, maybe this is my Monday morning uh, thing I have to do. I need to create a text file. And I'm going to use a format of my text file that has the year, the month, and the day, the computer name, errors.txt. So I type, type that. And then I decide, and I want to save this in my C work directory, so I define a variable for that. So C dollar path. That's where I'm going to create my file. I'm going to create a header. So that's basically some text, and that text I'm going to add to my text file. And then I'm going to take the logs, because I saved the result to a variable here. This is out variable. I'm going to take the logs. I'm going to sort them on the source, select a few properties. But I just want unique, because I know that when I have errors, very often I may get the same error multiple times. And I don't need to see every single error. I just need to see the error once. So this will make that easier. I'm going to format it as a list and send it to my file appending it. So let's say, you know, that's a lot to type every single day. So basically what I'm typing would be one, two, three, uh, you know, about 20 lines of code. And just to show you that this worked, you know, I end up with a text file that looks like that. So that's my goal, OK? The better approach, instead of me having to type those 20 lines and then looking through the file, because God forbid I try to tell Joe, hey, when I'm gone, I want you to type these commands. The guy print it out, and he'll go, yeah, that, that's not happening. So instead, Let's look at a scripted approach. So I got a more of a script that I can run. Now, the advantage when doing things interactively is you can take advantage of shortcuts, such as truncating parameter names and using aliases like FL. But you know, for those of you who are new to PowerShell, you know, you may be looking at my commands and go, what is that? You may not have known what FL is until I told you that. But if you were to look through this, and then you'll be able to, you know, you'll have this to look at on your own and see format list, oh, okay, well that, I kind of understand what that might be, or out file. So here I can even, because this is a script, and this is something that I only have to type once, I want it to be legible easy to understand. You, I always tell people, you know, write the script for the next guy. Because you might be that next guy. You might come back to a script in, you know, six months and look at it and go, what was I doing? What was I writing? So we kind of have some rules here when it comes to writing scripts. You know, full commandlet names, no aliases, add comments. Uh, that's with the pound symbol. It's the comment character. You can see here it's green. Um, 
So this now becomes a little bit easier to understand. We get event log, log name system, computer name, entry type, grouping, sort. I suppose I should make this clear. I really don't have too much problems with uh, using the aliases sort or group. Or common aliases like dirks. I think everyone should know what the dirk command is. Uh, defining a file name for the report. Defining a text for the file header. Creating, I even added some right hosts with some color so I can add some progress messages to what the script is doing because it could take a while. Um, setting the content. Still not quite perfect here. And logs and then a result. So I could come back here and I'm actually going to run. I I can run it right from here because this is just a script. So I can come here and run. Let's do it from here. Get okay. uh, tab completion. Found that. So there's my message, and so now it's running through, and it's going to do the same thing that I had done when I pretended to type all those commands interactively. Except now I can give Joe this get daily event log ps one or put it on a network share or wherever he can access and say, run this script, just go, you know, whatever the path is to the script, run it, and it will get the results and do everything that he needs to do. And then he doesn't have to do anything. I mean, anyone should be able to type just the name of a command. So it's consistent. It's documented. When I leave and get promoted and go to the corner office, the next person that comes in learns, oh, if they got to take care of this, they can open up the script and go, oh, okay, I kind of understand there. Now, there are some issues with this. I mean, it certainly works, but we're kind of limited to this, right? I've got hard-coded in values for, say, 36 hours and the computer name. Well, there's probably a better way to do that. So I have a second version of my script. Oh, let's look at it first before I dot source it. Here I've gone ahead and taken basically that same script concept. I think of a script as a canned set of commands. So instead of me having to manually type all of these commands, line six, seven, eight, for example, I can just run the script and PowerShell kind of types them for me, if you will. In PowerShell scripting, we can then get to a function which is kind of like a command line. And mine is written this as an advanced function. I, we don't have time to go through all of the features, but I have things such as validation. So I can now take a parameter for the log and I can give it a default value of say systems, and most of the time I want system event log, but maybe I want something else. Maybe I want to be able to check a, a domain controller and I want to check the Active Directory web services, for example. Maybe I want the hours to default 24, but maybe I might need a search for 36 hours or 4 hours. So I've given myself some flexibility here. And I've now added some verbose messaging. I'm taking advantage of Right progress, I'm splatting, a lot of advanced techniques here. You'll notice I've got lots of comments, so even if you were new to PowerShell, you could look through this and kind of understand what's going on, because there's nothing cryptic here. It's all full command names, full parameter names, and the end result is still going to be the same. So in fact, I'm going to run it, so I've dot sourced it. And you can even, when you have a function like this, you can get help. And I could go through and add comment-based help to add in all those parameters and examples as well. But even just the bare bones of what I have, I get at least the syntax. So I want to do this for the, I'm going to check Chicago DC02 application log for the last 36 hours, running my command. Up here, this is the right progress. It kind of helps me 
know what is going on for something that could take a long time to run. I'm not saying you have to write when you get to writing PowerShell scripts that this is where you need to go, uh, but eventually you want to get to write PowerShell commandlets or I'm sorry, PowerShell functions, tax them as modules, so they work just like scripts, just like commandlets. The end result will be a file in the work directory, wherever I let's go back to event log two. Because I also specified the path, I left the default of work. So there'll be a folder in the work directory. I've modified, so it's going to show errors. So this be the date, computer name, oh uh, yeah, the, the, the date, the computer name, the log, and then errors.txt. And it'll, PowerShell will build the path. That's still running. I must have had lots of errors. So it ran, and I just had my function write the file. And if I wanted to, I could then open up that file, and I'd see that same type of result. So instead of me having to type all of this, I took advantage of PowerShell. This particular function just really works with one log on one computer. Not that difficult to have this query multiple computers, multiple logs, multiple entry types. Yes, it adds a little bit to complexity, but really not that difficult. So that is kind of a look at you know, some core PowerShell principles and try to show them in practice in a relatively practical way. Again, if you're new to PowerShell, don't feel like you have to understand everything that I'm showing. You uh, you eventually get your should be able to get your hands on my demos and scripts here, and you can poke around and look at the code a little more closely. All right, uh, let's go back to the slides here. There's I mean so much more to PowerShell. I mean I really just had time to hit some of the again just some of the core principles and concepts so that you kind of understand what PowerShell is and why it should matter to your career. The whole world of PowerShell remoting, being able to run a command on you know 100 machines simultaneously. Instead of me going out from my machine to 10 machines and running a command, I can run that same command 10 times simultaneously and have the results come back to me. That's incredibly powerful stuff. Uh, WMI and SIM, you know, all the management information that we have available, very easy to get through through PowerShell. Again, we're not necessarily scripting, we're just running commands, and we can take the, those same commands and put them in a script file. If we want to save some typing, be a little more consistent. Uh, PowerShell supports full regular expressions. You can work with XML documents. Uh, we can work with a registry and lots of other providers such as IIS or the certificate store. So many things. Things with advanced scripting and modules, I kind of gave you a taste uh, in that last function. Things like workflow, uh, desired state configuration, which is really the hot topic now, and I know that's really where a lot of you will be going to uh, in this series. So I got a couple recommendations, and then a little homework, and we'll talk then a little bit about DSC here. So if you are in a position to kind of dictate or control or influence where your organization should be. I would hope that you would try to standardize your clients and servers on at least PowerShell version 3, if not the latest version that that client will support or that server will support. Turn on and leverage PowerShell remote management. Now, when you get to PowerShell, or I'm sorry, Server 2012 R2, remoting is turned on by default because you really can't manage a, a 2012 R2 box without PowerShell remoting. Even though you look like you're using a GUI, there's some PowerShell stuff happening under the hood. It's safe, it's secure, just turn it on, you'll be very happy. And begin training. Um, read books, get on Twitter, Google+. Uh, I've got courses on Pluralsight, uh, if not private training, conferences, whatever it takes for you to begin 
training and learning and reading and expanding your PowerShell knowledge. And the best way to do that is to find ways to use PowerShell every day. Even if you just read help and examples for a random commandlet or an about topic. If you do that once a day, that will be a huge, huge help. I have a series of books here. Again, if you're totally new to PowerShell, the Learn PowerShell in a Month of Lunches, which I co-written with Don Jones, is a great way, very popular. I, I get a lot of terrific feedback because in a month of lunches, basically the book is written like 28 chapters or so. You read a chapter at lunch, do a little couple exercises, and by the end of that month, you should be proficient enough to get yourself in trouble with PowerShell. Well. To, to get stuff done in PowerShell. The tool-making book then would be the follow-on book where you want to learn more about scripting, building tools with PowerShell. Uh, the PowerShell In-Depth and Administrator's Guide, which co-written with Don Jones and Richard Sidaway, uh, also PowerShell MVPs, that is the reference guide, which will teach you or give you information about all sorts of things. Uh, the second edition covers PowerShell version 4. And I also have a new features course on Pluralsight if you are more into the video training thing. So you've got the links there. Again, you'll have a copy of the slides uh, for that. Now, I do have, because I was told to give you homework, and the homework is kind of intended to help you see how to get into this DevOps, into this DSC world. So what I have for you to do is build a configuration script using PowerShell. And so well, the, the premise is I have a new server I need to stand up. And from my Windows 8 or 8.1 desktop, I want to be able to run a script that will go to that machine and do a number of things. I want it to test and test for and create the directories if they're not there for work scripts and reports. I then need to configure services to auto start, bits, Windows Update, remote registry. I then need to configure the security event log on that server to be 32 megabytes in size and not overwrite entries. And then when I'm all done, I want to take kind of a snapshot of services and export them to an XML file and do the same thing for processes to an XML file. All of these things you can do with common commandlets. You should be able to find in out-of-the-box PowerShell commands, I don't think of anything here that requires anything extra, any additional modules from Microsoft or other vendors. This is all core stuff. You should be able to look at some of the keywords here to find help for the commandlets to do these sorts of things. Once you can kind of get it to work interactively, see if you can build it into a PowerShell script. You can use PowerShell remoting. Um, I'm going to assume that remoting is already enabled. You don't have to automate the remoting piece. What, there are several ways that you could accomplish all of this, um, but that is your, your homework. And there's a reason for that. And that is because I want you to understand where we're coming from. This, you know, my homework here, this is kind of the way that we have managed servers like forever with, with PowerShell. DSC is the next generation of management. So instead of doing a configuration, which is kind of what my homework assignment is, and this is what we refer to as a set of imperative commands. You know, it's imperative that you do this. You have to tell using PowerShell, I want to set a service to meet a, to be a certain way. Instead with DSC, you will design what the end result will be. And this is done through a set of declarative commands. So I'm going to declare 
that the bits service should have a start mode of automatic. That's all you have to say. Now, you will learn that there are PowerShell tools that you can use to create that configuration, but PowerShell figures out how to make it so. Uh, we kind of joke about DSC as the, uh, the Jean-Luc Picard of uh, management. So, you know, Picard says, I need that service to be set to auto start. Riker, make it so. And DSC is the Riker of our environment now. Picard doesn't care how it gets done. Riker has to figure out how to do it and makes it so. And in our case, in DSC, you'll learn about the local configuration manager that works with DSC resources in order to make it so. So you just tell the server, I want you to look like this. I don't care how you do it. Just make it happen. DSC and the local configuration manager take care of that. Remember I mentioned earlier we use PowerShell as the glue to hold everything together that we manage, and that's especially true of DSC. There are PowerShell commandlets that you will learn about and use to create your configurations, to deploy them, to manage, to troubleshoot. So DSC, we're gonna, you're going to see more and more about DSC. The more you know about PowerShell, the greater your capability of building really terrific and powerful DSC implementations will be. And even with DSC, there will still be times where you want to use PowerShell to say, you know what, I need to check the disk space on 50 web servers. Easy enough to do with PowerShell is a one or two line commands. And you know what, and I want to build an HTML report for it. So it's not like you're going to give up your use of those PowerShell commands. We're still going to need PowerShell to do lots of other things, but when it comes to the configuration and stuff with DSC, uh, PowerShell will take away the, our needs to be more imperative and we can be more declarative. So with that, um, it's really not that difficult. If you set your mind to it, you can do it. So um, questions? Comments, what else did you want to know? Hey Jeff, this is Anthony. I just got to say this has been like one of the most action-packed as far as content uh, that I've seen in a while. Uh, not that any of the others have not had content, but <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a ton in here that's awesome. Um, okay. One of, go ahead. No, go ahead, because I'm just leaving the slide up, so I'm not seeing the chat. So if you've got questions, just read them off to me. Sure, yeah, no, one of the questions was um, we were kind of talking or you were talking about, um, you know, different functions and different different plugins that you can load into it. Um, how does, like, operator overloading work or, or like, function, thing function overloading? Um, how do you specify which, which plugin your command belongs to, if any vendor's commands overlap? Uh, how does that work? Oh, yeah. um, naming collisions. Uh, well, that's a tricky thing. You kind of have to, well, my, let me stop a moment here. My initial thought is you just have to be careful and know what you're doing. For example, um, both Hyper-V and VMware have commands called get VM. If you happen to have both of those tool sets loaded, which I have in the past, I can't remember what you do, how it'll determine. There is a rule for whether it's a function or a commandlet as to, you know, if the naming collision doesn't, uh, doesn't work. If you suspect that there might be collisions, when you import a module, there is a option to import it with a prefix, and it's just a temporary prefix. So, okay, so like if, if you had like a I'm just going to say like a VMware, you know, plug-in pack and, you know, you could prefix it with like VMW underscore or something like that. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Or, and a lot of vendors already do that. I mean, they build their commands that way. For example, uh, Quest, now Dell, or it's still Quest as far as I'm concerned. You know, they have a free set of commands for managing Active Directory. 
but they knew that they couldn't call their commandlet like get user because Microsoft got that. So they all of their commandlets for the noun, so like user or group, but they all are prefixed with QAD. So they knew there'd be no naming collision. Um, but when you import, let, let's go back to the Power CLI stuff. Um, yeah, VMware, they don't have a prefix because it's still, you know, get VM. But you could put in a prefix if I was to, uh, I can't remember if that's Power CLI's package or snap or module because you can only do prefixes for modules. But if you import the module, you could say import so that every noun is prefixed with my, for example. So then you can do get my foo and not worry about conflicting with another get foo commandlet. Or just to have you know, separate windows open. You have as many PowerShell sessions open as you want. That's another way. And the final way, there is a syntax where you can specify the module and the commandlet name, but I almost never use that, so I could not tell you what that is off the top of my head. But there is a way where you can specify the full, this is the full path, if you will, to the command. So if you suspect that there is collision, and really the best thing to determine that is just get command. So you do get command, uh, you know, get VM, for example. You'll, if there are multiple versions of get VM, you'll see both of them, then you can figure out how you're going to rectify that. Sure, that makes sense. I actually didn't know that get command was a thing. I've used PowerShell, and I've used PowerCLI for, for the VMware stuff. Um, but yeah, that was one that, that is new to me, so cool. Yeah, so this is Ahmad. We got a lot of comments saying this was by far uh, great content, and a lot of people are even saying they're going to have to watch this several times over. Great, thank you. Other questions? Others I'll throw up my contact information here. I blog quite a bit. Um, I'm also a contributing editor at Petri, really doing pretty much all their PowerShell stuff. Uh, you're welcome to email me. I'm very active on Twitter um, and somewhat on Google Plus as well. But other questions that you have. I speak at conferences. I do trainings. I make courses for plural sites. So you should be able to find me somewhere. Any more questions? Any questions on the homework? Is that kind of what you guys were looking for, I hope? Does it seem doable? Scary? Yeah, no, I think I think that'll work. And if anybody missed anything, you know, um, like you know, like we said, this will be recorded. You can always go back. I'm sure I'm gonna watch this again just because there's so much to it. So um, no, I I thought it was great, and, and the feedback seems to be yeah really good. Just a lot of content, which is not a bad thing. So we do have uh, one question: um, Was there any desired state configuration resources? Oh um, yeah, you'll get you guys got Stephen Moraski coming up. Um, yeah, there is on PowerShell.org. You'll see a link to DSC resources. There is a free ebook. The D on DSC. So if you're trying to get a jump on a jump start on that, um, the PowerShell in depth book, the second edition book that just came out, uh, has a chapter on DSC as well. Uh, but really, the best place is uh, PowerShell.org. Any more questions? I was going to say, I saw that, you know, there is a, a Google Plus page for this series. So if people have, and I got hooked up in that tonight, so if there are you know, questions about homework or follow-up or stuff that I've presented, you know, uh, post them there and I'll try to answer them. Yeah, that's actually good, a good, uh, good shout-out to our, we do have a V Brown Bay community uh, Google Plus page. So... For those of you that do use it, I know I use it a lot, but I'm 
who wanted to see what's doing. <laughs> but we do have a community that people can use and post questions and talk and interact. And, you know, it's just a, another place, you know, also Twitter, if anybody asks questions, um, we always watch the V Brown Bay hashtag. So just another place that anybody can interact and get feedback and that sort of thing. So we just had another question pop in. Okay. Uh, PowerCLI versus PowerShell. The Vim core is not needed. Uh, is this because it's built in? Oh, I have no idea. I don't know the technical details of how PowerCLI is implemented. So I, that would be something to ask, uh, like Alan Renew for Luke Deakins. You know, someone more on the PowerCLI side. I've used PowerCLI quite a bit, but I have never gotten into the nitty-gritty details like that. <coughs> so do we have any more questions, comments? Otherwise, thank you, everyone, for spending time tonight and listening to me blab on about PowerShell. No, this was uh, good stuff, Jeff. We definitely need to bring you on for uh, a second, maybe even third round. Sure. Yes, please. <laughs> I'll raise my hand on that one. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, very good stuff. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.